Hanne. Na? Mushkila bish hummal, mushkila hana. Hanraja ima baad, ini wahna binikhdim, au ad kithira kida binikhdim mudda twila, u baadin binninsha baad ma bedi il khidma. Hanraja ima baad baad ma bedi fakarna fiha kida. Awil haga lazim niskurha u niftikirha temalli, in il khidma da'wa min rabbina, لخدمته ف ف يعني أنا we're called by him for him ف we're called by him meaning هو اللي بيدعينا and for him meaning الخدمة بتاعته هو so the service really the Lord sees the person who loves him في 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 John 14 he tells us if you love me keep my commandments and very simply his commandments are two things to love him with all our hearts and as a result of our love for him, we end up loving his children as well, our neighbor, so to love our neighbors as ourselves. When he sees our love for him, and he sees our love for our neighbor, he entrusts us with the service of his children and service within his church. And so he calls us to his service. He calls us because he sees something in us. When he sees feelings of compassion, feelings of mercy, feelings of sympathy for the weak and the downtrodden, then he entrusts us with their care as well. And because it is his service, uh, because it's his calling, it's also his service. And so the service is his. It's not ours. And very often in the service, كثير أوي نقول أنا عاوز أعمل كذا في الخدمة أنا عاوز أعمل كذا 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 وفي الآخر مثلا ال ال الكوردينيتر الأمين الخدمة يقول لي لا أو اللي معايا في الفصل يقول لي فكرة تانية وبش راضي أو أبونا يقول لي لا وأنا أزعل وأنا أمشي أقول ده ده عمرهم ما عاوزين يعملوا ال ال اللي في في ذهني فكرة حلوة وتملي بيتفشوني بنسى ان مش مش خدمتي انا بس خدمة الله خدمته هو فهو اللي بيدبر كل الخدمة لو كان فعلا ربنا عاوز الموضوع ده يتم هو كان سهل هالي ف always remember ان الخدمة uh, the, the, the service itself is his and so if he sees something is important for the service of his children he will ensure that it works he will ensure that it proceeds forth and always submit. Don't all, you know, sometimes we grumble, we complain, and we end up suffering because of it, because we think we are in control. But the reality is, we are just you know, observers watching God serve. He's truly the one in control of His service. There's a documentary I watched a few weeks ago, and it really touched me, and I shared this with some people. Um, this Catholic nun, she became a nun at a very young age and she passed away at a very young age. She, she died a few years ago in an earthquake. And there, she used to wake up in the morning. She reached that stage in her life where she used to wake up in the morning and she would pray and say, Lord, here's the blank check of my life. Do with it as you please and I will obey. Every morning, every morning, I would say to Eddie, check. I've seen a check. If you sign a blank check, اللي هت sign اللي هي هياخدو هيصرفو زي ما هو عاوز. هي كان بتعب مع ربنا تقوله Eddie حياتي كأنها blank check. اطلب مني اللي أنت عاوزه وأنا هنفس. كل يوم صبح كانت تقوله كذا. Do we have that attitude in service? Can we come to the Lord and say, Lord, what it is you will, what it is you want, and I will do. As you please, Lord, I will fulfill, I will obey. So the first point is, we're called by Him, for Him. It's His service, and so He calls us to it, and we come and fulfill what it is He asks of us. It's not our service. We have to remember that it's not mine, it's His. Number two, we must have personal discipline in our spiritual life and our relationship with Him. I cannot help someone if I'm not being fed myself. I cannot go and serve unless I'm being served. 
by the Lord Himself. And so somebody comes to you and says, give me a cup of water. I'm thirsty. Give me some water. And you go to them with an empty cup. It's not going to quench their thirst. You give them an empty cup, it doesn't help the person. And so you need to fill it with water. It is the same with our hearts. If I go and I, I speak to somebody, I need to fill their soul. And in order to fill theirs, I must be filled as well. Out of the abundance of the heart, then we speak. That's why he tells us, uh, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. It shines, it's visible, not because you're doing anything, but because internal. There's a relationship and that light is reflected, the light of Christ is reflected and, and is seen by others. And so out of the abundance, he who feeds on the gifts of God um, internally can also feed others. But very often we find what? يعني كثير قوي نلاقي ايه بن بن بنقرا الانجيل اه بس عشان نحضر بنصلي اه بس عشان خايفين المحاضره المحاضره اللي جايه دي مش مستعدين ليها فيا رب سننا ف حلاقتنا مع ربنا ما هياش علاقه شخصيه بس علاقه كده uh, superficial in order for me to serve I need to read so I read but I don't read for me personally in order to grow I don't read to fill myself I read in order to prepare myself. But we have to have this personal relationship. And so we must work on this by having a personal canon, a personal prayer rule. لازم كانون روحي في حياتنا. فمثلا ممكن اروح لابونا اطلب منه كانون روحي في الصلاة، كانون روحي في القراية. وكانون الروحي ده مهم عشان علاقة علاقة مع ربنا. ولما جاهد فيها ربنا بيشوف اللي انا بجاهد فيه في الخفاء في الخفاء. So when he sees what is hidden, uh, when he sees when he, you pray when no one is around, when he sees that you wake up in the middle of the night to make prostrations on behalf of the service and on behalf of yourself in order to be filled, when he sees that you fast a little extra for the acquisition of a virtue, the Lord bestows his blessings. The Lord bestows many blessings upon you. And he touches you, and you experience his presence in your life. And when you do, you are able to serve because you are being filled. There's a story of a bishop when, when he was a monk back in the, I think, 50s or 50s. Um, he was very faithful to fulfill his spiritual canon. So he, would, he wouldn't let a single day go by without praying his canon. And the monk's canon is basically the whole Agbeya. The monk prays the whole Agbeya. And he never let a day go by without him praying. And then his bishop came to him and he said to him, tomorrow we have six bishops visiting and he was in charge of cooking the food. And so he told him, I need you to prepare the breakfast, the lunch and dinner for all six bishops. And back then, يعني, six bishops means half the synod. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> so it, it's, it's very stressful. And so he got up very early in the morning at 3 a.m. to start preparing. And they didn't have nice cooktops like we do. They didn't have nice ovens like we do. It was يعني, حاجات بسيطة خالص. So it took him a long time to cook all day. So he started at something like 3 a.m. And he went back to his cell at around 8 p.m. So we can imagine how exhausted he is standing on his feet, serving, doing all this cooking. Exhausted. And he says, he didn't pray a single psalm all day. He didn't have time to open his Agbeya. And he got to his cell, and because he was faithful in his canon, he said, yeah, Lord, you know I've struggled all day. At the very least, I'm going to pray veil. So veil is Ladat al-Sitar, takes a few psalms from each hour. So in his mind, I'll pray a few psalms from each hour that way. I'll, I'll touch upon the whole Agbeya in one way or another. So he figured, I'll pray veil. He started praying veil, and he was very tired. He got on his knees, and as he's praying, he got to the Psalm, Psalm 26 in the Agbeya, the Lord is my light and my salvation. As soon as he said that, he says his, his cell was filled with light. He couldn't understand, like, it was just filled with light. And he felt full of energy. He got up, and said, no, 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 I'm going to restart from scratch. I'm praying all my psalms. 
So he started first hour, third hour, sixth hour, and so on. Why? Why did the Lord visit him that day like that? Because he was faithful. He had a relationship. He was faithful in his canon. When we are faithful in our canon, the Lord will also visit us with certain moments of grace like that. But it's up to us. And that's why in Isaiah chapter 65, he tells us, It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. How we want to call upon the Lord for an issue in the service. How often is it we want to call upon the Lord for a, a, a kid that we're serving that is going through a distress and he tells us, before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. Why? Because they are speaking to me. They have a relationship with me. If we have that kind of relationship, the Lord answers our calls. The Lord hears our petitions. One time, I met this man who was crying out to the Lord. This is the example, and if fulfilling that verse of Isaiah. I was, I was in Houston. And I was staying in the church, and uh, I needed to go get my medicine from Walgreens. So I went to the Walgreens, I'm driving there, and I was very tired, so I said, okay, let me Google Starbucks. And so I Googled Starbucks, there's supposed to be one right next to it. So I get there, and I don't see the Starbucks. I don't know why I didn't see it, I just couldn't see it. It was in one of those, those uh, grocery stores. And because I had been in a monastery for over 10 years, I didn't know that Starbucks was located in grocery stores. So I parked the car and I was like, okay, instead of wasting time, let me pull up the Starbucks app. I'll order my coffee from another store. Once I get my medicine, it'll be ready. I'll drive to the other store and pick it up from there. I'm walking into the Walgreens and I see and there's a Starbucks. Like, and now I see the sign, Starbucks inside of that store. I thought that was odd. Got my medicine, got in the car, drove to the other Starbucks. I pulled over got into the store. As soon as I opened the door, these two men walk up to me. One guy comes and he's like, in Arabic, he's asking me, Abuna, where are you from? So I told him, I'm from St. Mary and St. Moses Abbey. I'm with you for the week. The church was literally two minutes away. So I figured they're from that church. They're like, no, 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 we're from Australia. And he points to the other guy and he tells me, his daughter is in the hospital. She's having surgery for spinal cancer, we need someone to come pray for her. So the dad was in distress, crying out to the Lord, and before they called, he answered. He used me as a pawn to move me around with a silly desire that I have in order to go serve and to go. So I said, okay, let's go. And so we're going there, and I told the guy, you know, I wasn't coming to this Starbucks. I wasn't coming here. And he tells me, Abuna, we weren't coming here either. So I asked him, well, what do you mean? Well, so I told him my whole story, and then he tells me, we were driving, and I told the dad of the girl, would you like some coffee? He said, yeah, but I don't want to do a detour. Let's just go to the hospital. We'll grab a coffee there. They stopped at the light, and they saw the Starbucks, so they had gone in. And by the time I got there, they were walking out. And so God arranged things for this man who was in distress, so that while they were still speaking, while they were calling out to him, the Lord was answering their cry for someone to go and pray for this daughter. And so a simple rule of, of prayer, have a relationship with him, have a canon. And one simple rule for, that we can all apply in our lives, in the morning when you wake up, this is something I read by Pope Kirillos a long time ago. In the morning when you wake up, don't snooze, get up. And you don't hit the snooze button, the... the, the the, the gift from the devil to all of us, right? So, so don't hit the snooze button. Get up. And get up, do the sign of the cross, because you have risen. Sleep is kind of like a, a, a taste of death. And you have risen from this death through the cross, the power of the cross. And so you do the sign of the cross and you thank him for the new day. Then you go into your bathroom and you splash cold water on your face. Not warm water, not hot water, cold water. When you get cold water on your face, it stings. Especially in this cold, and you get cold water, it's even colder. So you wake up, and then he says you go back to your room and you pray. You pray at the very least, our Father. 
and whatever Abuna has asked you to pray. But at the very least, if we don't pray at all, and we start this way, and we thank God for the new day, and we pray our Father, and we stand before Him, asking Him to bless our day, then we establish a relationship with Him. We begin in, in a canon, a, a prayer rule that we have in order, that, that allows us to speak to Him on a daily basis. Because you know, sometimes we say, oh, I'm too busy. The more busy you are, the more you need to pray. We don't realize that. So number one, we said, for those who came late, we're reviewing some principles in the service that need to be, that, that need to be reviewed. And, and maybe we know them, but we need to kind of remind ourselves of these things. So number one, we said, we're called by him for, meaning the service is his. He calls us to his service, to do his service, not my service, his service. Number two, we need to have a discipline and a personal relationship with the Lord. Number three, we need to always maintain a spirit of discipleship, an awareness of our weakness. No one is called to serve in a state of perfection. We're all growing, we're all developing. And so we need to remember that as we develop, we are in need of learning. We are in need of growth. And so we're never, we'll never reach a, a point where I can say I know everything. That's why the Christian life is the life of discipleship. We see it in the life of the disciples themselves. They were Jewish men, the 12 apostles were Jewish men who knew the Jewish customs and they knew what prayer was. And yet they went to the Lord and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. The disciples who already knew went to him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And so we need to do the same we need to maintain that same attitude. Lord, teach us how to serve. Lord, teach us how to pray. Lord, teach us how to follow you. Lord, teach us how to lead your children because we don't know what we're doing. And so we need to always turn to him and ask him to teach us. But we also need to learn to submit to one another because this is discipleship. To submit to the church, to submit to the Bible, to submit to Abuna, to submit to the coordinator, Instead of always having resistance toward everything that is being said, we need to have discipleship and the willingness to learn from one another. Um, you know, something, for example, like the, the servants meeting, it's, it's something that's given to us for our benefit in order to grow. And so it's an opportunity for us to come learn, for us to come and, and develop. But very often we'll find you know, the servants meeting is, is one of those things that is, yeah, and so so, not always attended. You know, if, if there's a guest speaker, maybe people attend. I, but if there's no guest speaker, then half the people aren't there. Am I wrong? <laughs> but it should be something, it should be something that is always attended. Why? Yeah, you think about it. You're running after your children in Sunday school to attend your class. And you're telling them, hey, attend. Whereas, what are you doing? You're running away from your own meeting, right? So, so they need to run after you as well. Um, and who's going to run after them? <laughs> Always have the, the spirit of discipleship. It's very important. Along with the spirit of discipleship comes the acknowledgement of my weakness. Because I'm weak and I need to grow, I know that I have deficiencies. This leads me to also be sympathetic towards those that come to me with their own weaknesses. I'm not harsh with the kids. I'm not harsh with those who are still struggling with different sins or different rebellious attitudes or whatever because I have my weaknesses. And so because I'm weak, I understand that they are weak as well. And so I'm compassionate. I'm sympathetic towards them. And so the successful servant needs to have that spirit of discipleship. The successful Christian needs to have the spirit of discipleship. So number one, we said we're called by him, for him. It's his service. Number two, we have to have discipline or a relationship in our spiritual life, relationship with God. Number three, we said discipleship. Number four, integrity. The word integrity comes from the word integer. Does anyone remember math? What does integer mean? Okay, it's not a math test, so I'll just tell you. It means whole number, right? 
Integer means whole number. Integrity is derived from that, means we are whole. We're not divided. But we're often divided. The truth is we come to church on Sunday, we're one person. We go back to, to our work and school and whatever during the week, we're a completely different person. We come to church, give a Sunday school lesson in class to the kids, we're one thing. We go back home in our inner room, we're something completely different. We live a dualistic life. But integrity means we are whole, we're not divided. When I'm standing in church, I'm the same person I am at work. When I'm standing in a classroom, I'm the same person I am at school. When I'm coming here in the church preaching, I'm the same person in my inner room when no one is seeing. And when I am, if, if I maintain that integrity, I fulfill the, the, the you know, the, Saint Ava Piman, he says, be an example, not a legislator, not a rule maker. And so I become an example even when it's not seen. And this is the important thing. We think we need to just be examples in front of people. But the true example is set when no one sees anything. This is integrity. Because then we are able to live, yani, yani, when I come and I stand before you, and I'm living what I'm preaching, or I'm living what it is I'm, I'm, I'm telling you to do, I'm not being phony. And this is, this is seen, this is experienced. This is tasted by the children, they detect it. And so we need to have this integrity. When we were celebrating the, the 25th anniversary of the diocese, I shared a story at the celebration about Amba Yusuf, because I see integrity in him. Amba Yusuf would come to the abbey, and, you know, he tells us, you must attend the tasbihah. It's a mandatory thing for the monks. And so we have to attend the tasbihah. Tired, not tired, we should be there. Sick, not sick, unless we're bedridden. I remember when I first joined, he, he told us, if, unless you're bedridden and you can't get up, even if you're sick, you're in tasbihah. I saw Sayyidina with my own eyes with a cold in tasbihah. Sayyidina would come back from, from a trip somewhere, arrive at the abbey at 2 or 3 a.m. At 4 a.m. he's in Tazbeha. He sets the example. And one thinks, Yanni, is this something, a show he's putting on for us? Absolutely not. It's something that he probably practices, he does certain things behind the scenes when no one's looking, when no one sees anything, in order to have that integrity. I was sharing with some youth, Yanni, Back in, in June, I was, uh, when, when the Houston Rockets were in the playoffs, I was trying to kind of follow to understand what's going on because, you know, I had been in a monastery for a while, so I, I lost track of sports for a number of years. So I, I started watching some highlights. And one of the highlights that came in on the side was a, a clip, an interview with Michael Jordan. So I was like, okay, let me click on something I understand and know, you know. So I clicked. And, and it was an interview with Jordan about his game-winning shot back in 97 or something. His last shot that won him his last championship. And they were showing a clip of him doing this amazing move and then this, uh, does the shot with two seconds left on the clock or something and he, he gets it in. And Michael Jordan said something that, that stuck with me. He said, when no one was around, when no one saw, Day after day, I practiced that move and I practiced that shot. I must have practiced it hundreds of times. And so when it was clutch time, when it was necessary for me to do it in front of everyone, I was able to do it. This is what, yani, of course this is basketball, okay, but in our spiritual life, do I pray when no one's looking? Do I do prostrations when no one's looking? Do I fast when no one's aware? Do I do all these things or is it just a show? Having integrity is very important. When we are faithful in the small things, then the Lord rewards us with bigger things. Number five, <clears throat> so we said number one, we're called by him for him, it's his service. Number two, have discipline and a relationship with God. Number three, discipleship. Number four, have integrity. Um, and by the way, integrity, yani, bardo, I'll, I'll give you a few examples just to scare you, but, uh, but uh, to, uh, I want to illustrate the importance of it. 
Back where, where I grew up in Montreal, our, our, uh, our father was very strict on the servants. Very, very strict. And I don't think we can apply these rules anymore, <laughs> unfortunately. But it was amazing. <clears throat> I'll give you two examples. One, attendance in servants' meeting. If we missed three servants' meetings in one year, not in a month, <laughs> not, in, not in like uh, a quarter, in one year, three servants' meeting, without a valid excuse, we were kicked out of service. Kicked out, khalas, bye-bye, we don't need you. <laughs> So why? Because, like I said, we're running after children, telling them attend, and we're not attending our own meeting. We don't realize we are disciples ourselves. There is a meeting for us in order to grow, and we need it. The other example, uh, this I know some people, yani, this, uh, drinking. We weren't allowed to drink any alcohol, not because it's sinful, but because we are telling Masa and our children, don't get drunk. If they see us in a restaurant having a glass of wine, what goes to their mind? Oh, yeah, so-and-so is telling me don't get drunk, and he, he or she is drinking. It's okay. And then they go and they drink and they do whatever. They can't control themselves. And so I become a stumbling block. And so in his mind, rather than be a stumbling block, just cut it off completely because it's better to tie a millstone around your neck and to be thrown to the bottom of the sea than to be a stumbling block for one of these little children, the gospel tells us. If we were to attend a wedding and there was drinking or dancing, we were expected to leave. If we didn't, we were banned from service for three months. If it was repeated, again, we're kicked out of service. So I remember I, I moved from Montreal to Boston <clears throat> I'm living in Boston, khalas, I'm done with all this. Um, I went back to, to Montreal for my friend's wedding on a Saturday night. And then they had the dancing and drinking and so on. So I got used to the system and it didn't bother me, so I left. Like I excused myself, I left. The next day I went to church to get my Tonya blessed. Abuna saw me, so he's like, are you here for the wedding? I was like, yes, Abuna. He's like, did you uh, attend the drinking and dancing? I was like, no, I left. He's like, okay, good. And then he blessed my Tonya. <laughs> so, but the point, Yanni, the point of it all, Yanni, it's not is drinking sinful or not. It's rather, do we have integrity? And are we careful that the kids don't see hypocrisy in us? Because sometimes they may misunderstand something and consider it hypocrisy. So if we're able to cut it off, uh, from the root, it's much better. Number five, we face trials in service. My son, when you come to serve the Lord, prepare yourself for trials. This is what Sirach says in chapter two. And so my son, when you, uh, you come to serve the Lord, prepare yourself for trials. It's known that when I come to serve the Lord, I will be faced with different tribulations. It could be tribulations that are external, but also things within the service itself. I may get into an argument with the, the teacher or the, the servant that I'm with in the same class or with the coordinator or with Abuna and then I get irritated and so I'm faced with okay I, I'm going to ask to leave this class this service this, this whatever it is I'm doing because I'm not agreeing with what is being said or I stick around and face this trial because perhaps it's there for my purification perhaps it's there to help me grow Perhaps it's there. God allowed it in order for me to learn something about myself. That's why St. Paul the Simple says, he who flees from trials, flees from God, because these trials become an opportunity for us to turn to God in prayer and to discover ourselves. Um, <clears throat> and, so, and in Acts chapter 4 it says, you know, so St. Peter and St. John, they healed the, the, the man who was born lame, and the, the, the leaders come to them and they say, stop preaching about this Jesus that you're preaching about. And they went about preaching. They continued. They didn't care about the warnings. They knew that if they continued, they could be imprisoned. And in chapter 4, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, untrained men, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. In the face of trial, St. Peter and St. John had boldness. And this boldness came because, it says here, they had been with Jesus. 
And so when we fulfill point number one and number two and number three, knowing that the service is His, knowing that I need a relationship with Him, so I'm spending time with Jesus, I'm being filled, truly. I am with Jesus, like it says here, then I receive boldness in the face of the trials that I come across. This boldness enables me to face it. And finally, number six, we need to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the, 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 the people we serve. Christian service is not concerned just about delivering a message, but it's about truly transmitting the spirit. And that requires a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Do we have that? Do we pray, truly pray for the sake of the kid that is struggling in his or her spiritual life or in his or her home? Um, St. Paul, he says, in uh, Galatians 4, my little children from, for whom I labor and birth again until Christ is formed in you. So Christ isn't yet formed in these children, he's saying, but he's laboring for them. Do we labor for them, truly? Or do we just say, Rabbin Amahum, and that's it, and may God be with them. And we say a bunch of names maybe once a week in our prayers, and that's it. Do we do prostrations on their behalf? Do we go, maybe if they're a little older, meet up with them in a coffee shop and have a discussion with them? Do we have this type of relationship where they feel like when something uh, goes wrong in their life, they can reach out to us? Or do we just do our service on Sunday? I did my job and that's it. St. Paul says in Philippians 4, My beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and my crown. Do I long to see them? Do I long to spend time with them? Or do I always say I'm too busy or it's out of the way? The love that exists between the servant and the ones he serves depends on the servant sacrificing one essential thing and that's himself or herself. And so do I sacrifice myself for the person I'm serving? And so we need to come down to their level, understand them and see their needs and that requires for us to go out of our way. So. I said six things, and I repeated them every time so that I can test you. What are they? Very good. A relationship with God. Discipleship. Integrity. One-on-one, -on -one. and then face trials. Don't flee from the trials. Very good. When we do this, we'll hear the voice saying, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make her ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And the service is that entry into the joy of the Lord. When the priest gets ordained, <coughs> Sayyidina takes his hand and brings him into the altar and he says, Enter into the joy of your Lord. It's as if that ordination, the beginning of his ministry, is that entry into the joy of the Lord. And we too have this opportunity daily to enter into the joy of the Lord if we serve faithfully. May the Lord grant us to be very faithful unto the very end. And glory be to our God forever. Amen. Any questions? Until he gets in the Finally, O oh Lord, make us worthy to pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine kingdom come. Now the love of God the Father, the grace of His only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, communion gift of the Holy Spirit be with you. Go in peace, the peace of the Lord be with you all.